pornographic messages that were shared on social media. I'm going to be asking you, what can we do to cut out the disease of bullying from daily life, both online and off? Right now, though, a Tory MP, a Tory minister, not the same Tory MP as we're going to be talking about after two o'clock, the Tory MP who has asked universities to give him a list of their staff lecturing about Brexit. Another Tory MP, this one Rory Stewart, a former member of the British Arms Forces, he has said that the only way to deal with British IS fighters in Syria is, in almost every case, and those are his words, to kill them. Now, at first glance, I don't have much of a problem with that, and I want to know whether you do. 0345 6060973. But you have to look a little bit more carefully. Now, I think he might have clarified those remarks since to say, of course, we've got to act in accordance with the law. I don't have a problem with killing British jihadists on the battlefield, in the heat of battle. No problem at all. But what exactly did this did this minister originally mean? What do those words mean? Do they mean that SAS forces, let's just say, could round up British IS fighters in Syria and summarily execute them? Because surely that would be stooping very close to the level of IS fighters themselves. What should we do with IS fighters in Syria if they are caught but not in the heat of battle. I want to hear your views. And as the government's terrorism czar says people who joined Islamic State out of naivety should be spared prosecution and reintegrated into our society, that's the gist of what he was saying, more detail on that later, I want to know whether you agree with him. You see, my instinct is, if you have gone over to Syria or Iraq, and whatever your reason, you decided that you were going to join up with IS, I don't want to hear words like naive. I want to hear words like wicked and evil. Not the human beings themselves, but their intentions, what they have signed up to. It is a wicked, wicked cult that does need to be stamped out. And I think long prison sentences, instinctively, are what I would support. There is, though, a caveat. And the caveat is that our prisons have been described as universities of jihadism. And there is a real worry that some of these people will be further radicalised, perhaps even re-radicalised, if that's possible. So what is the solution? 0345 973 Before I turn to my special, special guest this morning, a chap called Gareth Brown, who's a journalist and an author of a Telegraph article I found fascinating this week, entitled, We Can't Just Kill All British Jihadists, But Our Prisons Won't Hold Them Either. Let's have a quick listen to the International Development Minister himself, Rory Stewart. He was speaking to the BBC about his suggestion. I don't think anybody should be in any doubt. These are people who have essentially moved away from any kind of allegiance towards the British government. They are absolutely dedicated as members of the Islamic State towards the creation of a caliphate. They believe in an extremely hateful doctrine, which involves killing themselves, killing others, and trying to use violence and brutality to create an 8th century or 7th century state. So I'm afraid we, we have to be serious about the fact these people are a serious danger to us. Mm. And unfortunately, the only way of dealing with them will be, in almost every case, to kill them. Hit the phones right now and let me know what you make of what our international development minister, you might think, trying to promote peace and development, the clues in the title, around the world, Rory Stewart, what you make of what he was just saying there. 0345 6060973. Let's go first then to my special guest, Gareth Brown. He is a journalist. He's been to Iraq and he is the author of the Telegraph article this week, We Can't Just Kill All British Jihadists, But Our Prisons Won't Hold Them Either. Gareth, a very good morning to you. Just tell us the gist of what you were trying to say in that piece. Oh, well, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Um, I suspect that my, my, my telegram this week was, was really trying to bring some level of nuance to this debate. When we talk about ISIS, we, we think about all these kind of horrible images of gratuitous violence, the beheadings and the kidnappings of, of aid workers and, and, you know, all these horror stories. And it's very easy to try and kind of quench and satisfy these, these primal instincts. Um, we want to see these people strung up. We want to see them thrown away 
in a thrown in jail without the key, executed, whatever. And actually, uh, I think it's important to kind of look at look at the these these individuals on a case by case basis, um, and 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 treat each one individually. They all have different reasons for joining ISIS. They have different reasons, perhaps, for leaving or not leaving. And sometimes, you know, taking this real kind of iron fist approach is actually self defeating. Ultimately, if if you know our aim is to keep. British streets as safe as possible from potential attacks by groups like IS. Sometimes uh, dealing them, dealing with them in a slightly, slightly uh, a smarter, not necessarily softer, but a smarter means than just the kind of iron-fisted um, kill them on the battlefield or throw them in prison for life is is, is necessary to keep to keep British citizens safe. You know, in London. There are two different questions, though, aren't there, Gareth? One is whether these people deserve punishment. And the second is how do we best keep ourselves safe from them when they retire? Let's just deal with the punitive element first. Even if someone who has gone to Iraq or gone to Syria to fight for ISIS, even if they have seen the light and decided that what they have signed up for, what they have been involved in, is wicked and evil and they are reconverting to being decent human beings nonetheless surely they deserve very significant punishment and also to, surely as well to deter others yeah absolutely and that, that was kind of one of the things i was trying to get across is uh, you know there there's absolutely no excuse regardless of the mindsets these people have when they do come back they have to take responsibilities if they have been involved you know and if they can be prosecuted for for the kind of really horrific acts that we know ISIS have been committing in Iraq and Syria then they actually they absolutely have to be put on trial for that the issue is sometimes well in, in fact a lot of the time that's not possible it's it, it can be very very difficult to prove that these these people have been involved in specific crimes. Indeed, because how do we? Our police forces don't operate in Syria and Iraq. Exactly, exactly. And, and there's a lot of unreliable information comes out of Syria. And, and you know, even when, when they are convicted, uh, the problem that the UK judicial system faces is that actually a lot of the, the, the cases, are, the, the, the sentences are very, very poor. Um, you know, sometimes just as little as two years, three years for people who have who have been going to, to Syria to join ISIS. Now, this phenomenon has been going on for the best part of five years. Within the next few months, we're going to see people who have been to Syria and Iraq returned, been convicted of various offences related to trying to join ISIS, and they're going to start being released. Um, now, obviously, no, no one considers them safe just because they served a two-year sentence. Uh, but it just shows you that our, our, our kind of judicial and penal systems really... They don't know how to cope with it, and it's going to be um, it's going to take place over the next few years. We're going to see a slow drip release of the people that have been convicted, um, and they get, they're going to be back on the streets um, and 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 in some regards considered safe when actually that's not the reality. You mentioned in your piece that Rory Stewart had clarified his remarks to say that we must act within the law. What do you understand his clarification to have been about exactly? Yeah, I'm, uh, so I understand that Rory Stewart was referring to actual British citizens on the field of battle in Syria and Iraq. Um, so, so, you know, whether it's taking them out with an airstrike or with coalition forces or the Iraqi or Syrian forces, killing them. Um, and I think that's something that most people would find uh, very, very difficult to disagree with, you know, if they're being attacked by these British jihadists. Absolutely, absolutely I don't think anyone would have qualms with, with killing them on the field of battle. It's just... Once they've left the field of battle, once they've fled the field of battle, when they're in Turkey or when they've made it back to the UK, that's when the, the problems and the difficulties really start to arise. And also, even within Syria and within Iraq, what exactly constitutes the field of battle is quite difficult to determine, isn't it? Rayad Khan, let's not forget, he was a 21-year-old. He died on the 21st of August in 2015, along with someone else, in what was described as a precision airstrike in Syria, according to David Cameron when he was Prime Minister, and he said that Khan was plotting barbaric attacks on UK soil and he was killed in an act of self-defence. Why do I mention this? I mention this because at that point in 2015, MPs had not yet voted emphatically as they would towards the end of the year for airstrikes in Syria. So we were not at war with anyone in Syria at that point. Do you think extrajudicial killings like that are justified? 
you know, I think if there's if there's intelligence that they are a threat, if if they're involved in you know an organisation that's paying a tax in Europe, um, in 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 the United States, in the West, then I, I actually, uh, you know, I do agree that that is justified, and we know. Particularly with that case with Rayad Khan, he was involved w- with a cell that included figures like Mohammed M. Wazi, um, you know, Jihadi John. He he was involved with some of the worst elements of ISIS. You know, he was really at the kind of dare I say it, lunatic fringe. And 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 this was a a, a group of people who who absolutely, you know, were plotting attacks uh, outside of Syria and Iraq. Um, and so then I think it just becomes a basic principle of of, you know, the United Kingdom, um, you know, keeping its citizens safe. There isn't exactly, of course, a benign fringe to ISIS, is there? There'll be some people who have been caught up in it against their will, and and that will be terrifying for them. But if you have signed up to ISIS, in my view, you've done a very, very bad thing. I just want to ask you a personal question, Gareth. I've been to Libya, I've been to Syria, not when those two states have been at war. And you are someone who's been to Iraq and covered the siege of Mosul. You're one of those journalists who has done a really, really brave thing and I want to get a sense from you of what that was like how scary it was what was it like on the ground and you also met I think captured ISIS fighters is that right yeah absolutely I mean I spent nine months covering the the battle for Mosul in in northern Iraq and um, you know the devastation is just almost absolute Um, you know there were absolutely no kind of red lines for Islamic State you know we saw them uh, using babies as human shields, you know the tales of of rape that women suffered at the hands of ISIS fighters. It's 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 beyond your worst imagination. Um, and 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 another thing that I, I think is really important to point out is, you know, people often say, well, what are Muslims doing? What are the Muslims doing? You know, to to fight this scourge of ISIS, this, this scourge of extremism, and in places like Iraq, it's overwhelmingly Muslims who are suffering at the hands of ISIS. It's 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 Muslims, particularly Sunni Sunni and Shia Muslims who are who are being executed, who are being enslaved. You know, they really are suffering the worst elements of ISIS, and they're also leading the fight. You know, they are the very very brave soldiers. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with the Iraqi special forces. They were going into the streets of Mosul. And really not knowing what was around the next corner, um, you know, it could have been a suicide bomber. It could have been, you know, half a dozen ISIS fighters with AK-47. And this, this is, you know, this is a really, really critical fight that, you know, there's an international coalition of more than 70 um, countries backing this fight. But actually, the sharpest edge of it is being done by, by Muslims in Syria. It's a, very, it's a very important point, Gareth, just very quickly and very finely, because we're late to the break. Did you get any sense when you were out there of what it is to drive people to this evil ideology? You know, there's, there's, the thing is, it's a complicated issue. There's, there's no one single thing. I think the ideology itself is really something that has to be challenged. Um, this kind of Islamism, which, which often goes unchallenged until it reaches a very, very violent stage. Uh, I think more needs to be done to challenge non-violent Islamism, non-violent extremism. But then also, you know, addressing basic things like poverty and stability. You know, I, I, I interviewed captured ISIS fighters who had joined because ISIS were the only ones that could offer them a solid salary or were paying the best salary in, in that part of the city. You know, some of the justifications for joining ISIS really were as basic as that. And, and when, you've got, when you've got absolutely nothing, when you've been brought up in, in a war zone like Iraq, you know, being offered a very stable salary of, of three or four hundred dollars a month can 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 be a really big deal the mundanity of evil gareth it's been brilliant to speak to you thank you so much for joining us what a brave man you are really interesting insight from gareth brown